Welcome back uh, to the Nutramedical Report, and we have Harley Schlanger back. Uh, Harley, a lot of issues going on. Um, I couldn't believe your comment uh, this morning about uh, Mr. John Kerry, who is, of course, a senior uh, recipient of, I guess, a, a bonus amount of APAC money. And now there's value, there's fights between various APAC donated and bought out politicians as to whether or not the resolution was broad enough. Apparently, uh, I'll let you say it. I mean, because it's so hard for me to even believe that he said this. These well, people are arguing about how much of a carte blanche they want to give to Israel to start World War III. It's just, it's insanity. Well, let, let's start with the broadest strategic picture, and then we can talk about some of the imbecilic personalities who are unfortunately playing this out. But I do want to commend, again, General Dempsey, because one of the things that's clear, well, let, let's start with the broadest picture. Look, this is not about, as you know, not about Syria's alleged use of chemical weapons. It's not about, is Assad a better Democrat than al-Qaeda? You know, what's the best government for Syria? All this pious horse crap we hear from these American politicians, uh, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that this is a dying empire, right. and it's blowing apart. The, the, one of the things that kept coming up in the British debate is that the, the people, there were two groups who opposed the war in Britain. The Labour Party said, look what Tony Blair did to get us into wars in the past. We don't want that to happen again. And I think that's very significant because in the United States, why are more people not saying we got into wars that cost us trillions of dollars and, and hundreds of thousands of healthy young men and women lost their lives, lost their health, their, their mental health? Why isn't that an issue that it was done on false pretenses and we're about to have it happen again? So in Britain, the Labour Party came out against the war because of the Blair policy. The Tories came out against it because they were defending the military. They said the British military is exhausted, that Great Britain no longer has the economic force to sustain warfare in an unlimited way on numerous fronts. And so you had sanity emerge in Great Britain. And as a result, Cameron uh, had to bow to that. He argued vociferously, look at the evidence, look at the evidence, and people said, the, the evidence isn't convincing, and the consequences of going in are much worse than the consequences of not going in. Now, in the U.S., the president has the other view. The consequences of not going in are too devastating. Uh, well, what are the consequences? The fact that Obama made an absolutely insane statement saying there's a red line? Yeah, now, of course, on Drudge, they have the statement of, I didn't set a red line. And it shows a, a little picture of Obama's face looking stark, like, I'm not a liar. And you can tell us, like, yes, we can tell you're lying because air is moving over your vocal cords. Well, the fact is, he did use the term red line. What he's saying now is that it's an international community's red line, which is a, uh -huh. a bunch of nonsense. In that's, other words, it's a different red line. Quote. It's like at the Walmart store, you can buy a kind of national U.S. made red line or an international red line. He happened to go to the different aisle and got an international red line. You know, well, he's lying about that because he's the one who personally said it's a red line. Exactly. Now, the fact is, the red line is supported by the fact, and we have other sources who've talked about this, that the chemical weapons were given by the Israelis to, through two proxies to al nusra al-Qaeda, a sworn enemy of America, and st stated by the Department of Homeland Security and CIA as, as international terrorists. And we have Obama, in a sense, acting as a proxy for the Muslim Brotherhood. Many people say, is this guy a pro closet Muslim Brotherhood himself? And on the other hand, he's saying, I'm, I, I can't go to war, because even when you listen to David Oates' reverse speech on Rents last week, when he took some quotes and went backward, you can see the man, even Putin knew this, without even reverse speech, to say, he knew that Obama wasn't serious. He knew that Obama, it's like sticking your, yourself in the, in the briar patch or you know, against the tar baby. This isn't going to get go well. There's, there's no way that America well, can but, win but, but, in this situation, right? But, Dr. Deagle, I think Obama's absolutely serious about launching a strike. Now, 
The point is, it's a militarily stupid policy, number one. Uh, well, uh, how, well what's the strike going to accomplish? I mean, it, it's going to just aggravate the situation, increase the chances of it going nuclear. And, of course, if the if there is a tilt in the war toward El Nurse Al-Qaeda, and they do get the uh, the full cash of the chemical, biological, and other weapons that are in then Syria. Then there's which, a problem, yeah. Then you've got now, Israel yeah. that has to do a preemptive attack, and now we've got Damascus nuked. You've got Islamic cities nuked. You've got chemical weapons everywhere. You've got dead Israelis. You've got a situation where the Strait of Hormuz is closed and the world economy is now trashed. And we now have a worldwide catastrophe. Yeah, Those weapons that we brought here. But here's here's what I find interesting. Putin was asked, if it's proven conclusively that Assad used them, would you support a strike? And he said, I'm not going to rule that out. But he said, I'd like to ask my American friends, if it's proven conclusively that the rebels used the weapons, will there be a strike against them? (laughs) <laughs> Touche, is, man. This guy can play chess. He well, is uh, he Putin is, is cool, is, man. He's like, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't want to play poker with him, I'll tell you that. Well, maybe that's who John McCain lost his money to on the uh, video poker yesterday. <laughs> yeah, he now, was linked by, is, to, the, to, to Moscow, and, and Putin was on the other side under a pseudonym. But now, here's the other point. <laughs> the, the U.S. military is dead set against this, and, and you saw it yesterday. General Dempsey was sitting there, and they said... Can you guarantee that you could carry out some degrading of Assad's military in two days of strike? And he said, I can guarantee we can do that. I can't guarantee what the response will be. And that really sort of freaked out some of the people who were saying, oh, we can do it and that'll be that. Then he was asked, uh, well, what exactly is the objective? And General Dempsey said, I don't know. And then he shut off his mic because he didn't want to be bothered with follow-up questions of that sort because he's saying there is no objective. And then the third point with Dempsey, he was asked, uh, well, would you describe this as going to war, an act of war? And he said, I'm not going to comment on that. Dempsey already commented on it. He went to Obama Saturday morning when Obama was ready to order the strike. And Dempsey said to him, this is not going to go well. It's not going to accomplish what you claim your objective is. There's no guarantee that if the Syrians did this, that this would deter them. There's not enough evidence to back it up that they did it. You have no international support. And if you're going to do this, it's going to get screwed up, and you'd better go to the Congress first so that you're not out there hanging out alone. Now, isn't Walter when, Jones got a, doesn't Walter Jones have a bill that he needs to completely fully activate? Because it, yes. I think there's sufficient actions across what I would call the war red line that Obama's already crossed, which would indicate that he needs to be impeached immediately for crossing this red line. That's exactly. the red line that needs to be talked what, about. And that's why Dempsey said you have to go to the Congress. And then when Obama announced he's going to the Congress, what did he say? I've decided I'm going to strike. But I've, I've decided to go to the Congress first. Now, he what? didn't decide that. That's the Constitution. That's ridiculous. I mean, uh, he basically is saying that uh, I'm going to flaunt the Constitution and violate it, but I want to get a rubber stamp from Congress, and if they don't, I'm just going to proceed anyway. And Susan Rice told him, the, the current NSA director, the former U.N. ambassador, she told him that if you act on humanitarian grounds, it's not the same as a declaration of war. Oh, no. That's, that's the... You know, so it's humanitarian to blow up and kill Syrian soldiers and civilians. It's humanitarian to use battlefield tactical nuclear devices. It's humanitarian to destroy infrastructure and kill thousands of people. That's humanitarian? It's, well, and, humanitarian. and remember, Kerry, Kerry brought up that it's only Hitler and Saddam who used chemical weapons in the past. Hitler was put in power in part by the Bush family. And Saddam was given those weapons by George Herbert Walker Bush and encouraged by the U.S. to use them against Iran in the Iran-Iraq war. Right. In fact, I even saw the receipts, the FedEx receipts, for the shipment from Bethesda, Maryland, of biological weapons directly to Saddam during the Iran-Iraq war. I actually observed the physical copies of the receipts. So, yeah. The Bushes support the Nazis, they support El Nurse Al Qaeda. These guys are totally lockstep with the international banksters. And then we have more of this foolishness with Kerry and the Abominator. And 
then after that would be China and Japan. Right? Yeah. Welcome back, and uh, apparently there's a bunch of amazing articles here. And of course, Lewis has such a long history of analysis of world events. We have uh, his first article is, No Military Action in Syria, Thermonuclear Danger Too Grave. A lot of people assume it's just going to be contained to the Middle East. But we have a series of jockeying over the last, you know, since the so-called end of the Cold War of powers. We have the increased militarization of China, forced, by the way, by behavior of the West. The increased militarization of the Russians are now building another 100 new military bases, and they still have a single-based economy based on oil. We have China, whose economy is starting to crash because they basically sell things to the West. And uh, they're coming at loggerheads to the Japanese and to the Asia community. So we could have a hair trigger for a nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan or China and Japan. It's not just going to be contained in the Middle East, and that could easily bring submarines off the east and west coast of the United States with launch on command sequence hundreds of miles, not thousands of miles away, with a strike distance of five to ten minutes to any major city center on the eastern and western coast of the United States from Russian-based submarine-launched intercontinental ballistic missiles. So I don't think people understand that this is far more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is way more dangerous. See, I don't think that... that people are unaware that, that the risk here is broader war. I think there's a uh, hope that something can be done quickly and be gotten over with. And this is a hope that comes from just pure stupidity. It's, ir- it's we're, irrational. It's, uh, well, remember, we were told yeah. shock and awe would end the situation in Iraq, and it still took oh, yeah. a while to knock out Saddam Hussein. But we still don't have peace there, because mm. the, the other point I would say that, that Lynn and Helga Zeplarouche have raised repeatedly is that the thing that has to be investigated is this question, the policy of regime change, because that's what's being imposed by the Susan Rice, Samantha Power, Obama team. That, and this, this actually started, I sh- we should give credit where credit's due, the idiocy of this started with the neocons, with uh, the Wolfowitz and uh, the, the people of Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney. The idea it, we could go in, topple an unpopular dictator, and then rally democratic forces and set up a democracy. Now, what they failed to realize is that even in Iraq, a lot of people may have feared Saddam, but they appreciated the fact that you had a multi-ethnic population which lived at peace. And that peace was shattered uh, once you had the war launched. The situation in Afghanistan, one of the things that we never did was take on the drug networks. In fact, the British down in Helmand province have been protecting the drug trafficking partly because that drug traffic money goes through the Abu Dhabi and Dubai banks that are part of the broader city of London banking operation. Right, exactly. The and laundering the money operation. From, the money from opium poppies goes back into funding the Taliban and al-Qaeda, including in Chechnya. And meanwhile, the Russian drug czar has been pleading with Europe and the United States to join with the Russians to shut down the flow of heroin out of Afghanistan, which he said is now starting to kill large numbers of Russians, Romanians, Hungarians. Oh yeah, the Russian youth in, in Europe. The Russian youth in Moscow are drugged out of their mind. And it's also getting into Europe. Right. So, the, and he's also appealed on the basis. He said, if you want to really fight terrorism, let's go after the money laundering and especially the drug money laundering. And the U.S. refuses to meet with Ivanov and the other Russians who have proposed this. And instead, you know, we have Eric Holder talking about basically legalizing drugs in the United States. So, you know, the the thing that you've got to look at here is who benefits? Who really benefits if Assad is knocked out? It's not the Syrian people. It's not going to be Israel. You're going to have more instability and chaos. Who benefited from Mubarak being knocked out? In the short term, it was the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the Egyptian military did the world a favor by overthrowing the Muslim Brotherhood. Whether you want to call it a coup or not, I don't care. They did something on behalf of the Egyptian people and the world. The same thing could happen in Turkey, because the government in Turkey is increasingly unpopular because they're siding with al-Qaeda in Syria. 
So, you know, most of the world, I, I, I don't know if you saw this last night, Michael Burgess, who's a Texas Republican, had a funny line. He was asked, don't you really, uh, it was uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz who said, we have a lot of allies, two dozen allies that are going to support us. And so the, the host on CNN said, well, is that a coalition of the willing? And Burgess said, I call it a coalition of the invisible. <laughs> because it's not visible. What the Turks will do something. They have a strong military, but it's going to rebound back into Turkey. The Saudis, you know, are doing everything they can they, they, to listen, arm they, the rebels. They're, they're, they're going to sacrifice the Turkish. The Turkish Air Force is nothing as the Russians decide to bring the Russian Air Force in, or the Chinese bring their Air Force, or even the Pakistanis who got fifty, some almost sixty JL-17 jets given as a gift from China. I don't think people understand that this war is going to broaden very, very quickly. Immediately, if Syria is attacked, there will be an air attack by Iran against Israel. And, it, and Iran has already got commitments from Pakistan that they're going to be involved in the war using nuclear weapons against Israel. And not only that, NATO Western powers in Europe. So European cities could be targeted by Pakistan. And they don't get this, do they? Well, and the, the, see, the Chinese, why are the Chinese speaking out? because the Chinese do not want this to, to happen. The Chinese know that there are separatist forces that are funded by the Saudis that are moving against China in, in southwestern well, China, in Sichuan Right, province. well, the Uyghurs in, in China, they're trying to, to, yes, exactly, the Wahhabis are now deeply infiltrated in China, causing a major separatist movement there. And I don't think anybody understands just that the Chinese want to do business. They don't want to go to war. They're being well, hauled the same, into it. The same, thing, the same thing with the Russians. The Russians would like to not have to spend money on defense, but because of Obama's decision to proceed with the Bush policy of putting these uh, anti-ballistic missile systems, which probably don't work in any case, in Poland, Romania, and elsewhere, the Russians have to spend money to counter that. Meanwhile, the Saudis are also using their funded terrorist networks in Chechnya, Dagestan, South Ossetia to destabilize the, the Russian government in, in those places. What's the effect of that? Well, it spilled over into Boston, didn't it, with the, the uh, Chechnyan terrorists. The Chechnyans outside of Iraqis and Libyans, the third largest grouping in al-Qaeda in Syria, is from Chechnya. So yeah. Putin warned us. He said, you've got these terrorists that you're supporting. Relatives and of the Sarra brothers, right? That they warned us about, but we never heeded it, despite the fact they had all these police and military people around in the, in the marathon bombing. Yet we didn't listen to the Russians who warned us until it gives adequate warning that this is going to happen now. We're supporting, literally, we're supporting now the most vile elements of El Nurse Al-Qaeda, Sworn enemies of NATO and of Europe and America, yet we're supporting them financially and with intelligence and satellite communication, sat phones, etc. It's craziness. Yep. Uh, this is not going to go well. Even if the slightest strike happens, I would not bet that Syria and Russia and Iran and Pakistan would not retaliate. Position and it's a uh, you know fully pulpit is the world superpower. Welcome back and uh, Harley. Uh, it's remarkable some of the uh, wisdom that's in these articles here. Uh, it's obvious that if America does do a launch, Russia is going to basically like the master of black belt samba, which is the Russian uh, martial art that uh, Putin is an expert at. They'll simply either knock out with the S-400 system the missiles coming in towards Syrian territory, or if they want to bump it up a notch, as they did when the uh, Israeli-Americans supposedly launched and testing the Iron Dome system, Russia went into high alert de detecting that they could be coming toward Russia. People don't understand this could immediately in entrain Russia to make a thermonuclear attack against Israel and our bases in the Mideast and to take our ships to the bottom of the Persian Gulf. And people don't understand that what's Obama's response, like General Dempsey, is to after they do this and Russians go to high alert and decide that it's time to, to, uh, to, to move the submarines a few hundred miles off the eastern western coast of the United States and call Obama on the red phone to say, stand down or else. What's Obama going to do then? What's he going to do I, then? 
Yeah. I agree with General Dempsey that it's incalculable what will happen and that no one knows for certain what the Russians will do, what the Iranians will do, what the Syrian government will do, what the Israelis will do. Nobody knows. And when you're going into war, what Dempsey said is that you never know what the next response will be. Therefore, you don't go into war unless you have a fully thought out plan that's strategic, not just short term tactical, that has allies and that has an exit strategy. Right. Now, this, this president has none of that. So rather than for me to speculate on what the Russians will do or whatever anyone else no, but will the, do. The potential tells you that there's what I'm pointing out is that there's total chaos. Yeah. Right. So the potential shows that there's no plan, no exit scheme. There's no even a plan for what is the response of Syria, Pakistan, Iran, or any other allies in Muslim countries, or Russia or China. People now, don't understand this war could trigger off an India-Pakistani war or a Chinese-Japanese nuclear exchange, uh, which, by the way, Japan has tons of nukes. People might not believe that, but they do. And what but we're really seeing here... Point. The, yeah. the, there's another point here, which, which I really would like to bring up, which is that as part of the incalculable nature, it may be that the, nobody will do anything, there'll be a two-day strike, and then what? What's changed in Syria? What's changed in the relationship of forces involved in this? Nothing except the United States has demonstrated that it is not a thoughtful military power. We're right. just well, reacting to defend the president's ego. Now, well, Bill Sheryl Assad has already Bill Sheryl Assad has already stated he is willing to go to the table to negotiate, and has been for over a year. Yet, exactly. Al Qaeda and all these elements in the so called Syrian Free Army say the only thing we'll accept is uh, Bashar al Assad's head on a plate, cut off, and complete decapitation of the government so that we can go in and do whatever we want, including get access to these advanced weapons. And by the way, our first target will be Israel. And, and they've already Assad stated they're going to use these weapons. And so Assad is basically totally cooperative. How is, this, how is striking? Uh, so-called the Syrian regime going to change the viewpoint that they need to negotiate between the al nusra al-Qaeda and these other terrorists. In fact, if anything, it will embolden them to say, now give us the jets, now give us the heavy weapons so we can finish off Assad. And by the way, when they take out Syria, they're also going to march on Jordan and they're going to take out most of western Iraq. Uh, and most of western Iraq will come under the, the control of these Syrian terrorists. Of these well, that's, that's why my, my point is that since we don't know exactly what would happen in a response, that what you're looking at is the classic case of saying, well, what's the least bad option? And <laughs> that's how they're trapping the Congress. The point is there are other options which are not bad. Namely, well, get, uh, to, I know that LaRouche has got to lay them, lay them out because we need to realize that they only want to lay out options like, okay, we can take off your right leg or your left leg. When yeah. really, how about we just trim your toenails well, instead of taking off is, your legs? Yeah. Look, this <laughs> is the point. If you get people thinking that what we're dealing with is out of control military situation, you could have a Russian response, Iranian response. So then you start coming up with a plan that will be ineffective that's not going to cause all these other things. That's one of the things McCain and others who are really insane and want to fight, what they're right. saying is that, well, since we're going to get a response, we might as well go all the way. Now, what about the other side? What about recognizing that Assad does have a right to defend his nation? I heard an right. interview with a, a Syrian journalist the other day on NPR, and the NPR reporter was saying, look, I know you can't speak your mind because of censorship. And she said, there's no censor censorship of me. And he said, well, what do you think of Assad's use of chemical weapons? And she said, it's not been proven. And then they said, well, what would you think of the U.S. striking Syria for the use of chemical weapons? And she said, number one, it hasn't been proven. Number two, we're opposed to any foreign interest coming in to tell us what to do. We're Syrians. We believe in the nation of Syria. And the reporter couldn't understand this. And she said, what's wrong with having a peace process? Now, Putin raised this again in his press conference today, and I also want to tell you about what happened with Obama's press conference in Sweden. Exactly, yeah. But when Putin was asked about the uh, prospects of this attack, what Putin said is that this point, well, would you attack the rebels if it turned out they were using the gas? Then the second question that Putin said is, how about we go to Geneva and actually have a discussion of how to end the civil war? 
And he, uh, Putin didn't do it, but a Russian commentator quoted Martin Luther King, who said, violence begets violence. Now, Obama tried to wrap himself in the mantle of King last week, but King would be totally enraged about the United States launching a strike in Syria. Now, this came up in Obama's press conference in Sweden today. Remember, he decided not to meet with Putin, so instead he went to Sweden. And the Swedish press said, why are you about to launch a war? What about the Nobel Peace Prize? Shouldn't you go the extra step for peace? And Obama was getting very irritated and unhappy with these questions because he can't answer them. Right. Just like Tony Blair, his answer is more war, more chaos. Right. Now, there was a very interesting proposal by a legal scholar from uh, the University of Illinois Chicago Law School, Francis Boyle. He said, instead of going to vote on going to war on September 9th, how about voting on Obama violating the Constitution and therefore having a bill of impeachment against him? And I, I think one of the points that we really have to make to your listeners is that now is the time for them to get out of their armchairs and make calls. Congress is being bombarded with calls. We could A, a vote against Obama would go a long way towards removing this guy. He might have a total breakdown. So I think we've got to encourage every listener to call your congressman, call other congressmen, and just say, we, the American people, oppose a strike. Yeah. Of any exactly. Sort. And the fact is, there's no need for it. And it's not going to accomplish anything except increase the chances of an unexpected response that we have no plan to, resp to counter. That's exactly the point. And therefore... Instead of scenario mongering, let's stop it. Let's right. take away from Obama what he thinks he has. He thinks as president he can order a strike anytime he wants. And that's not the Constitution. And I, I commend Rand Paul, who said that he's considering a filibuster. He said if his kidneys are up to it, and his bladder's up to it, and he has comfortable shoes, <laughs> he might do a filibuster because then you'd need 60 votes to stop it, to get, a, a, get this for Obama. Yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, He's got a sense like of humor. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty good attitude. And, and uh, you know, we need a bipartisan approach to this, don't we? Uh, and I, I'm certain that this is going to be similar to the 13 votes that the British Parliament uh, handed the head of uh, David Cameron back to him and say, no, uh, I don't think we're going to do Armageddon today, sir. Uh, and uh, the British government, I'm sure this is embarrassing because it's... How long has it been since the British government has not been given a parliamentary authorization to go to war? How oh, many? What is it? Uh, it's, it's 150 been years? a long time. I don't, I don't yeah. know if they've ever actually not been granted an authorization. To yeah, go to I think war. it's at least 150 to 200 years. I think it's something that this is historic. We need the same thing in France. We need the same thing in America. And I think actually Obama is in the, in the back room, in the blue room, watching his ESPN, fretting and hoping Congress will tie this up in knots so he can get it off the hook. That's what I think. Be back in a moment. He says to the apostles, right? He says, ah, Caesar is well. Render unto Caesar what he is bailed into Caesar. Right? <laughs> Welcome back. And uh, Harley, uh, I guess the uh, you mentioned on the G20 that they're going to discuss this bail-in policy. I would use the analogy of the speech that uh, Jesus did when they tried to catch him uh, with a question about whether or not he should render taxes in the uh, coin of the realm uh, to the Roman uh, Caesar and he says he pulled out a coin out of a fish's mouth and says render unto Caesar what is Caesar's I guess what he's saying is these guys are going to try to bail in your money uh, it's probably going to happen and they're probably going to create a crisis afterwards once they have the bail-in policy to make sure that all your bank accounts quote it, what does it say on the on the note it says Federal Reserve I guess they own it it's not your money it's theirs so uh, this is the, this was the whole point in the Cyprus policy, because what they established was this idea that the governments had the right to give to the banks the ability to seize the bank accounts of their depositors. Mm -hmm. and so what, what occurred with that was a 
bit of an uproar in Cyprus, and then it pretty much everyone shrugged their shoulders and they said, well, it's mostly rich Russians who are suffering, which is not true. Uh, there was a lot of people who suffered, including many, many family businesses and small businessmen. But then while everyone was sitting around not paying attention, and the line was going out that the European financial system is at least temporarily under control, the Bank for International Settlements, which has a long history going back to supporting the Nazis in the 1930s. Uh, by the way, they had set up something called the Financial Stability Board, which was under the control of a man named Mark Carney, who at the time was the head of the Bank of Canada. Carney is now the head of the Bank of England. And he was brought over there as there was a revolt going on in Great Britain calling for Glass-Steagall. So he came in and he said, no, we're not going with Glass-Steagall. We're going with bail-ins. And what they mean by bail-ins is that if a financially system or a systemic international financial institution, which is called a sci-fi or a too big to fail is another name, if it comes into trouble, then the bank resolution policy includes giving the bank the right to seize up to 75 or 80 percent of its depositors uh, deposits wow. now this as we <laughs> investigated this is included in the dodd frank bill under title two of dodd frank it's the policy of the bank of canada the bank of australia and the a couple weeks ago the european union met and they ratified it although it still has to go through the parliaments and for the most part it's going to be rammed through the parliaments and now at the G20 summit, this was set to be the main issue, support for the bail-in policy globally. Now, Obama, being an imbecile, doesn't realize that his attempt to push this through might be disrupted by his attempt to get support for an illegal war. Now, yeah. there's one other factor here that's really important. One of the things that came out last week from the Snowden revelations is that the NSA, the U.S. National Security Agency, was tapped into the internets of the internet emails of the presidents of Brazil and Mexico. Yeah. Now, the Hacking new them. president of hacked. Mexico, yeah, yeah. who was supposedly friends with Obama, found out that his email messages were being uh, hacked by the NSA. Uh, the Mexicans were upset. The Brazilians were totally livid and enraged. Both Mexico and Brazil are members of the G20. Right. So Obama's going to get an earful from virtually everyone. There are a couple of puppet governments there, like Turkey. Um, there are one or two others. Uh, it's unlikely that the Indians, the Brazilians, the uh, Mexicans are going to go along with Obama with what Obama's doing. So what you've got is a situation where the banking and financial system is out of control. The U.S. economy continues to stumble and sputter and collapse. Europe is a, is a basket case. And so what does war do? War changes the subject. War enables governments to say, we have to have austerity for the sake of our war. We have to have everyone sacrifice so that we can fight the big, nasty terrorists whether it's al-Qaeda, Assad, Saddam, Putin, and you need to shut up because we also have the NSA in your phone and in your Internet, and if you get caught up in our uh, sweeps, you could find yourself in prison uh, and held indefinitely. Yeah, so, they have an article oh, by Jack, uh, Josh Rogan that the Senate Democrats are breaking all their own rules to rush to vote on the Syrian war uh, quickly. Well, have you heard that? Yeah, there's some Democrats like Pelosi, like Steny Hoyer, uh, are doing that. That's why, look, if you live in a district that you have a Democratic congressman, don't assume that that congressman is going to support Obama. We can break them away, but we're going to need a mobilization. And, and what I'd like to just conclude this, this uh, what seems to be a shorter and shorter hour every time now, because there's so much, <laughs> yeah, so much to, to say. <laughs> but look... If, if you're a listener to Dr. Deagle, and by the way, I should tell you, in, in New Jersey the other day, Diane Sayre, who's running as an independent against Chris Christie, who's a, basically Obama uh, overstuffed. Anyway, she had a very big town meeting, and four of the people who were there came in and said, oh, we know you from Dr. Deagle. 
So <laughs> good, good. you have listeners all over the country. Now, instead of sitting there being angry about what Obama's doing and then turning on reality television or you know going out and getting drunk or whatever people do to escape reality, make a phone call. Make two phone calls. Call up Pelosi and tell her that she's the biggest hypocrite in the world. What happened to her opposition to Bush on the war policy? Yeah, Call well, up Democrats who are against Obama and say, go, brother, go, sister, don't go along with this. It's a violation of the Constitution and our party's tradition. And call Republicans and tell them to stop being lapdogs for this traitor Obama. Right. If we generated a couple thousand calls from this show today, if your listeners had the guts to follow through and make some calls, it would make a difference in what happens next week when the vote takes place. Well, right so, now they're trying to ram it through, so we need to stop this to the senators and the congressmen. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee narrowly approved a modified war resolution Wednesday afternoon, a vote to 10 to 7, with one member, Senator Ed Markey, a Democrat um, Massachusetts, voting present. The committee's action allows Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid to bring the measure to the floor as early as Friday, following a break for the Jewish holidays. That would allow a vote by the full Senate as soon as Monday, which of course is the 9th, the same day they're going to go before Congress, giving the Senate, Senate a chance to pass a war resolution before the House has a chance to craft and pass a resolution of its own. So they're trying to one-up Congress. This is not reasonable. It's Congress, not the Senate, that makes a decision to go to war. It's what the are they House trying to do here? That's right. So right. that's why calls to senators, calls to House members, you know, really, if, if you've never done anything like this before, now is the time, because as we've been discussing, there are incalculable results that could occur. The, the most benign situation is that the United States will become the biggest outlaw state in the world if we do this. Uh, but the implications are that's the least far uh, worse. that's the that's the least noxious. Yeah, uh, I'm going to make some predictions. The first is terrorism will go up. Orders of magnitude won't be managed by the CIA either by uh, by support or by monitoring like the Senarov brothers. Number two, uh, what we're going to find is our international status as a superpower to re negotiate peace anywhere else will become zero. Especially after hacking into all these people's, all these countries are supposed to be G20 allies. And the third thing that happens is the situation deteriorates further. We will have no position to literally negotiate with Russia or any other country when we've acted in such a vile manner to support extreme elements of terrorism against a sovereign state, Syria. This is not reasonable, and it's going to we're going to have an unbelievable backlash against America. Well, and the House and the Senate are split on this. There are a number of, of congressmen, House members, who are having town meetings the next couple of days to get the opinion of their constituents. Don't hold back. Call right. your congressman. If you don't know who your congressman is or you need some talking points, call my office. We'll be happy to talk to you. Call us at 800-922-2907. Uh, but for God's sake, act do something. So it's 800-922-2907 if you want to get more on, on what you can do, what you can say. Yeah, very important call. This is probably the most uh, dangerous time since the triggering of World War II with the Nazis. This is far more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is far more dangerous than Gulf War I and II. This could accelerate to a global thermonuclear biological chemical conflict literally within hours to days, not weeks to months or years. So do something. Don't sit there and... Don't, don't sit there. Just time. don't be entertained by the bizarreness of what we're telling you. Do something. Call your senator and congressman right now. Okay. Talk to you next week.